Hey everybody, so today we're going to be covering chapter 44, discussing hazardous materials. In this chapter we'll go over uh, how exactly do we identify uh, materials that are to be considered hazardous, as well as some guidelines as to take in mind when dealing with on a hazmat scene. Every day there are billions and billions of hazardous materials shipped throughout the United States every year. And it can be transported anywhere from in a 18-wheeler, on trains, in airplanes, even in vehicles. In fact, there is a vehicle that drives in our local area that carries a nuclear material to hospitals to um, transport or transporting the nuclear materials needed for them to be able to do x-rays and CAT scans and so on and so forth. Uh, if he got into a, a car accident, it would be a hazardous material. Other examples of hazardous materials include explosives, gases, uh, flammable liquids, uh, corrosive materials, as well as radioactive materials. Uh, we need to be able to recognize the indications of a hazmat scene, as well as how to properly handle a hazardous emergency. Now, hazardous, hazmat scenes often come from some type of accident that causes a spill. These are some of our more common issues, such as tanker trucks transporting oil or gasoline up and down our highways. Hazardous materials can cause patients to asphyxiate, can cause irritation, um, can ca increase their risk of cancer. It can even act as nerve or liver po uh, poisons or even cause loss of coordination, seizures, or even alter mental status within your patient. They can cause skin irritation, burns, respiratory distress, nausea and vomiting, tingling or numbness of the extremities, and it can even cause the patient to have blurred or even double vision. The principal dangers that you see with these is the toxicity of it is flammability as well as radioactivity. Table 44-2 goes over TRACEM. TRACEM is an acronym that could be used to remember the types of, ha of damage that can be caused by hazardous materials. Thermal, which is caused by some type of heat source or burning material. Radiological, such as nuclear fuels and byproducts. Asphyxiation, which causes, which is caused by a lack of oxygen due to the chemical vapors. Chemical, which is toxic or corrosive chemicals. Ideological, which would be biological hazards such as anthrax. Mechanical, which would be trauma from bullets, shrapnel, and so on. The amount of damage the patient gets depends on the dose, concentration, the route of exposure and amount of time the patient is exposed. To identify hazardous materials, there should be a placard, which is a four-sided diamond-shaped sign that designates hazardous materials in transit on roadways. This placard contains important information that can aid you in determining the best course of action. The driver also should have shipping papers, or MSRPs, which identify the exact substance, quantity, origin, and destination of the, via of the substance. The color of a placard also indicates what class of hazard is contained within. A legend that indicates whether the material is flammable, radioactive, explosive, or poisonous is also commonly displayed. Often, a placard displays a four-digit UN number or United Nations identification number that can identify the hazardous material as well. The NFPA system, uh, 704 system identifies potential danger with the use of background colors and numbers ranging from 0 to 4. The blue diamond is a gauge of health hazard, the red fire hazard, the yellow reactivity hazard, the white diamond is used for symbols that indicate additional information such as radioactivity, oxidation, need for protective equipment, and so on. For ex so this is that placard. Let me get my pointer up. So blue is your health hazards. Red is flammability. Yellow is instability. 
And white is any special hazards that the pa that you should be aware of. So this would be an example of one on a tank. So one would mean a low health hazard. Two would mean a moderate flammab uh, flammability hazard. Yellow is your ear. <clears throat> excuse me, is your instability, and then there are no special um, precautions needed for this substance. Shipping papers are required to be in the cab of a motor vehicle or in the possession of a train crew member in the engine or caboose, in a holder on the bridge of a water vessel, or in, an, in the aircraft pilot's possession. As of June 2015, OSHA's hazard communication standard required chemical manufacturers, uh, shippers, or distributors to provide information regarding the hazards of chemicals or chemical compounds. This information is also provided in the form of safety data sheets. You can also use your uh, senses. Now, this is off. Can we also con the least reliable way to determine the presence of hazardous materials at the scene of an accident? But it can help you, such as smoking or uh, self-igniting materials, boiling or spattering of materials. If you're able to see the vapors. frost near a container link, or even unusual condition of containers. Look for signs that can, um, on scene, that restrict entry of storage tanks or containers. You'll see these with a uh, placard, or on these uh, areas. Many visual clues may indicate the probable presence of a hazmat scene, such as this storage tank. Now obviously, you know, it could be used for a multitude of different things, but one thing that we see storage tanks used a lot around here is for peanuts. Well, if you just jump into a uh, storage tank that has peanuts in it, it is a hazmat scene because it is a confined space. Um, it can be, it is very flammable, um, and it can, you could possibly suffocate in it. Now there are multiple resources available um, to assist you in identifying resource materials. The one most commonly used and is actually required to be carried is the ERG or Emergency Response Guidebook. This has a multitude of different, um, now this updates every year so you always want to make sure that you have the most, most up-to-date version. In your ERG, it is broken up into different sections. Your yellow section is if only the four-digit UN number for a hazmat is known, then the name of the chemical can be found here by matching it to their number. This also lists the appropriate guide section for specific actions to take. Within the blue section, this lists hazmats, hazardous materials by name in alphabetical order with cross-referenced well, cross by the UN number. It also provides the appropriate guide number for each specific hazardous material. Within the orange section, both the yellow and blue sections provide information that references the orange section. In the orange section, all hazardous materials listed in the ERG are grouped into one of 63 guide numbers, which ultimately provide information on the primary hazardous and emergency response actions to be taken initially when a hazardous material is, con is contacted. The orange section also provides information regarding personal protective equipment, evacuation distances, spill control, fire control, and first aid measures. Within the green section, certain chemicals are high. Or excuse me, for the green section, um, you will there are certain chemicals within the blue and yellow section that are highlighted in green. This denotes that the chemical presents a specific hazard as a toxic industrial hazard when spilled. A hazardous material listed in the green section as a toxic industrial hazard has specific initial isolation distance 
and other information depending on the relative greater to toxicity. You also have at your disposal poison control centers, which is a, f a simple phone number that you can call uh, to get information about a substance. You also have uh, Chemtrack, which is a phone number that you can actually call um, and give them the information that you on the tank as much as you can, and they can help you figure out what it is. Uh, whenever contacting a resource, you always want to provide your name, callback number, fax number, nature and location of the product, the UN number or name of product, as well as name of carrier, shipper, manufacturer, co-signee and point of origin because definitely if you're calling Chemtrack or even using the Wiser app uh, it can help you figure out which uh, what it is that it is being shipped helps them narrow it down at least accidents involving hazardous materials often occur at inconvenient locations making communication difficult it's critical that you make every effort to keep a phone line open to, to when discuss when contacting resources when contacting a resource, you want to try to provide both the type of container and size, quantity of material, uh, local weather conditions such as if it's a windy day, uh, if it's raining, um, number of injuries and exposures, and the uh, emergency services that are present or are responding in route. You also want to let them know exactly wh uh, where you, when you let them know where you're at. You want to they'll probably ask you is there any grass? Is the material getting into the grass? So that way they know if they need to be if uh, what needs to be done with that. Employers are responsible for determining and documenting the appropriate level of training for each employee. Because training addressed by OSHA usually has a fire service focus, the National Fire Protection Association has published Standard 473, which deals with competencies for EMS personnel at hazardous material emergencies. There are four le uh, levels that required by law as far as training. First responder awareness is usually the level required for EMTs. Uh, first responder awareness, um, they are trained to recognize that there's a problem, call for proper resources, and prevent others from entering the scene. First responder operations, this level of training is for those who initially respond to hazardous material emergencies to protect people, property, and the environment. They are trained in the use of specialized personal protective equipment and help to stop the emergency from spreading. Hazmat techs is more extensive level training and this is for rescuers who will actually plug, patch, or stop the release of a hazardous material. Hazardous material specialists, these are the rescuers with the train who have training with advanced knowledge and skills. They usually provide command and support activities at the site of a hazardous materials emergency. One role of a hazmat rescue is to avoid contact with any, and I mean any, unidentified material, regardless of the level of protection offered by your clothing and equipment. Um, you also want to make sure that you provide proper patient care depending on the area that you are in. If you get if you go into a hazmat scene, you want to make sure that you properly decontaminate your clothing, any equipment that was used as well as the vehicle, any vehicles uh, used in that rescue operation. If you ever pull up on a hazmat scene, never attempt to enter that area unless you have the proper equipment and training. Number one thing is to avoid, um, make sure that you request any help and try to make sure that you are uphill and upwind or upstream of the hazardous materials so that way you're clear of the danger. At the first responder awareness level of training, your actions at a hazmat incident should include the ability to recognize that a hazardous material incident has occurred. Avoid contact with the hazardous substance, isolate the area, and notify the appropriate authorities or response agencies. These actions can be easily remembered using the acronym RAIN.
R, which means recognize that a hazardous material incident has occurred. A, avoid contact with the hazardous substance. I, isolate the area. And N, notify the appropriate authorities or response agencies. Decontamination is defined by OSHA as the removal of hazardous substances from exposed individuals to the extent necessary um, and the extent necessary to prevent the occurrence of foreseeable adverse harm. When decontaminating, you want to make sure that you are familiar with the procedures necessary for that area. Unless specifically trained at the operations level, uh, you are not expected to take part in the, in the actual decontamination procedure. Most of the, of the uh, contaminants that will be on a patient uh, will be removed from clothing, or will be removed just simply with removal of the clothing. Pre-incident planning is essential and should include, or uh, with an incident management is essential. You should have one command officer who is responsible for all rescue decisions who should be appointed. All rescuers should be aware of who the command officer is. There should be a clear chain of command from each rescuer to the command officer and an established system of communications used throughout the emergency. The system should be one all rescuers are informed about, they know how to use it, and they all have access to. Your receiving facilities should also be pre-designated. Choose facilities that can handle large numbers of patients, have surgical capacity, and, if possible, have established decontamination procedures. Again, it is essential that any receiving facility be made aware of a patient's exposure to a hazardous material, even if the patient is appropriately decontaminated before transport. EMT should let the receiving hospital's directives guide them for transport procedures. When, once you go into implementing the plan, um, you want to make sure that you are able to establish a command system as well as a command post. As you're advising um, dispatch as well as command while they are en route, you want to be able to get information such as the nature, identi identifying the hazardous material, the type and condition of, any, of containers, as well as existing weather conditions. You also want to let them know whether there is presence of fire. Smoke from hazardous material fires can present an, an environmental hazard. It carries toxins and particles of hazardous material through the air, widening the area for potential contamination. Unless you are a trained firefighter, do not attempt to extinguish the fire. You also want to make sure that you let them know because if there is a fire, and their smoke, toxic smoke being transmitted, it, now we're having to expand our exposure area and more patients are potentially affected. You also want to let them know any work that's already been done, the amount of time that has elapsed since the spill has been, uh, ha since the spill initiated. Um, you want to establish safety zones, number of the patients, as well as the danger of victimizing more people. As an early priority at the scene of any hazardous material emergencies, safety zones are established in which a rescue operations and a specific sequence of decontamination procedures take place. The hot zone is where your contamination is present at. Your warm zone may still be in danger of contamination from patients and rescue personnel who have exited the hot zone. Anyone within the warm and hot zones as far as rescuers must have proper protective equipment. Gross contamination is performed at the entry to the warm zone. So when they go from hot to warm, this is where your gross contamination is done. While in the warm zone, the only assessment that is being performed is primary assessment and treating any life threats. Once all your life threats and primary assessment is, has been addressed, th then you'll go through complete de decontamination. The patient is then assessed and, and major injuries are treated within the warm zone and all protective equipment is to be removed before entering the cold zone. So, let me get my pointer. So within the hot zone, your contaminant is 
actually present at, so you're actually working in it. Bystanders are, should not never be allowed into this area. Within the warm or control zone, uh, you're still wearing protective gear and you're only doing normal, uh, excuse me, life-saving emergency care. Once you enter the cold or safe zone, this is where your uh, unit will be at for transport. And this is where you'll do secondary triage, uh, any stabilization and treatment needing to be done. Before entering the cold zone, any rescuers that should remove contaminated gear before leaving, going from warm to cold. There's a nine step decontamination procedure that is necessary f to properly decon. S the area during area one is where you'll be dropping your tools. You'll lay out a plastic to contain the contamination uh, approximately 12 to 15 feet wide. Uh, that can and this can vary depending on space needed. In this area, they will drop any tools and monitors that they had used. In area two, this is the decon wash pool and rinse pool with a shower. Um, this is where you'll do gross decontamination with brushes, soap, and water. Within the second pool, there you'll have a a portable shower to rinse off as much dec uh, as con to rinse off as much contamination as possible. Dilution is conducted inside the pool and diked areas. You're still wearing your suits and SVPA and moving into step three. During step three, this is where you will be removing your SCBA or replacing it as needed. In this area, you'll open your chemical suit. Um, Place them on the contaminated side if the rescuer is con returning to the incident. Replace the in SCPA container cylinder, question the rescuer to establish their he that health conditions are okay, and then close their suit. If they are re-entering, this is where they will re-enter using the contaminated side. If they are exiting, they will then move on to step four. During step four is where they're, now they're removing the protective clothing. You'll remove your protective clothing and place it on the contaminated side, and then move to step five or transport personnel to a fixed decon facility during inclement weather. If inclement weather is not needed or if you did transport to a fixed station, you'll remove all personal clothing and isolated items on the contaminated side, bagging all personal items. In area six is where you'll be taking uh, an actual shower and hygiening using soap and sponges dry off and bag cleaning items for disposal including clothing, sponges, and towels. In step 7 is where you'll um, put on clean clothes or paper garments if, not, if your clothes are not available. Step 8 is where you'll receive EMS medical evaluation including an EKG tracing and treatment as needed. Rehabilitation Rehab includes cooling off and replacing fluids. During step 9 you'll identify personnel and complete exposure records transport personnel to hospital if needed or to a fixed decon area. Any rescuers who are exposed must be decontaminated properly. Make sure that you report any exposures and any equipment and vehicles either used before or even after during transit while you're transporting patients to the hospital. You should still decontaminate them just in case. You'll also want to protect your ambulance and equipment from contamination. So in the back of the truck, you'll we'll actually um, create an isolation area. We'll take a um, thick plastic drop cloth and completely encapsulate the back of the ambulance, um, leaving only what is necessary for treatment of that patient, treatment and assessment of the patient in the open. The only work done within the hot zone is hazard assessment, control of the release or hazard, and rescue performed by trained personnel who are wearing appropriate protective equipment. These two are actually testing hazard levels at a spill using a gigameter, I think I said that correctly, uh, testing for radioactive material. 
when going from hot to warm, this is where you'll do initial or gross decontamination. If a patient is in the presence of radioactive material, um, but they have not touched it, um, either by on their clothing or body, they have only been exposed to it. Um, it can still be harmful, definitely, if it's radioactive and it's able to pr uh, go through the clothing and into them. Um, but the patient itself themselves do not become radioactive. Contamination is when the patient has become come into direct contact with the source. Now it's actually um, present on their clothing or their skin, and the patient is now would now be considered radioactive, um, and they are now a risk to emergency personnel if they are not properly decontaminated. If you are dealing with a radiation emergency, you should have a radiation safety officer or RSO, which is an expert specifically trained under federal government provisions to handle such situations. Never attempt to decontaminate a radiation patient. You want to try to protect yourself and others from contamination. Time is a critical factor in managing radiation emergencies. Trained personnel should remove the patient from the source of radiation as quickly as possible before you begin emergency care. If you are dealing with any kind of radiation sources, you want to try to increase the distance between yourself and that source. If an RSO cannot come to the site, you want to place the patient in a body bag, just like what the coroners would use, and zip it up all the way up to their neck. With their hair, you want to cover their hair with either a cap or towel and wipe the face with disposable wipes and place them in a plastic bag for proper disposal at the hospital. You want to limit your stay in a contaminated area to as little as time as possible and keeping as far away from the source as you can and involve as few rescuers as possible. Exposure to radiation is a cumulative um, thing and is determined by an inverse square relationship. That is, if you are twice as close, you'll receive four times the exposure. If you move twice as far away, you cut your exposure by four times. If equipment or tools uh, cannot be completely decontaminated, they need to be disposed of. Signs of an incomplete decontamination include debris adhering to the equipment, discoloration, corrosion, and stains. You want to survey the area for any symbol of radiation and being alert for any other hazardous materials as well. If there's a if it is um, in a container, do not park near it if it is damaged and make sure that you have on SCBAs um, before entering it so that way you don't breathe in any hazardous materials. Radiation sickness is caused by exposure to large amounts of radiation. Symptoms start from a few hours to days following exposure to the radiation and depending on the dose can last from a few days to seven or eight weeks. The amount of time between radiation exposure and the onset of symptoms is a relatively reliable indicator of how much radiation a person has absorbed. Signs and symptoms of radiation exposure can include nausea, vomiting, hemorrhaging, loss of appetite, fever, sores, and immune system suppression. A victim of a radiation accident is not contagious or infectious and generally will not endanger a rescuer. You are at risk of becoming contaminated if the patient still has radiation particles on their skin or clothing. Signs and symptoms of a radiation injury include hair loss, burns, and generalized skin lesions. Radiation poisoning occurs when the patient has been exposed to dangerous amounts of internal radiation. The result is a host of serious diseases, including cancer and anemia. Usually the one 
the way only way that someone can be exposed to it internally is if either someone injected it into them or if they were ac if they accidentally ate it. You can reduce your risk of radiation exposure by dividing the rescue work among many rescuers with teams composed of as few rescuers as possible. The Federal Nuclear Regulatory Commission recommends that an individual in an emergency, while engaged in activities deemed necessary for the preservation of life, be exposed to no more than a one-time whole body dose of 25 rontgens. Another approach to reducing, reducing risk is to shield the radiation source, not you or the patient. For example, the best protection against gamma rays, one type of radiation that is extremely dangerous, is lead, preferably one to two inches thick. If lead is not available, any material that has thick mass, such as bricks, concrete, or several feet of dirt will do. Now, unfortunately, um, there are some criminal use of hazardous materials. The production of methamphetamine, which is a stimulant, requires converting the active ingredient in cold decongestant medicine, pseudoephedrine, uh, pseudo into another compound. Doing this requires reacting pseudoephedrine with several hazardous chemicals that may include lithium, phosphorus, sodium hydroxide, and hydrous ammonia and hydrochloric acid. This can result in the production of toxic gases including phosphine, an extremely toxic gas that poses an inhalation hazard even in small amounts. If you ever find yourself walking in on a meth lab, get out. Call P excuse me, call PD and also get um, fire department en route. Also with marijuana clandestine drug labs, these include the cultivation of numerous marijuana plants indoors um, where there is the possibility of you inhaling um, marijuana. The threat of a terrorist attack has heightened the awareness of a need to better prepare EMTs to respond to incidents involving terrorist weapons including explosives, nuclear devices, biological agents, and chemicals. Um, with terrorist attacks, they can use a, a wide variety of different things, um, and it's you know it's bought and sold every day uh, throughout the world. All right, guys, that concludes this chapter. Uh, if you have any questions, please be sure to send it to me either in Remind or in Blackboard. Uh, make sure that you're doing your Brady Labs. If you have any questions about anything that you see on Brady Lab, make sure that you hit that send a, uh, instructor and it'll email me that question to me, and I can be able to help you out that way. Otherwise, y'all have a good rest of your day, and I will see y'all next time in class.